and welcome to another episode of Actors Inspiration with Amber Wagner. I am so excited to dive into today's interview because we are going to be speaking with a very, very working actor in this industry. He has five projects in development, seven films in production, 170 credits on IMDb. I met him on the set of Animal Kingdom, but you may know him from shows like Scandal, Bones, or Frasier. He's an actor, a producer, and has over 20 years in the industry. Hans Hernke, how are you? Good morning. I'm doing great. Good. I'm so happy to have you on the show. Thank you, Amber, for having me. I really appreciate it. Absolutely. So take it back to the beginning, because as I mentioned, I know you from Animal Kingdom, but you and I really didn't get a chance to talk that much. Tell me how your acting career began and what's kept you in it. All right, here we go. Let's Um, do it. (laughs) Well, I uh, was born and raised in Menasha, Wisconsin, and my dad owned a cheese company called Hernke Foods of the World. And when I was growing up in Wisconsin, I wanted to follow in his footsteps and become a cheese maker. And that did not happen because my dad and his brother sold the company. And that's what moved our family down to Orlando. And I was really bummed out about that because I was, I want to be a cheese maker like you, dad, you know. <laughs> and um, I, there was a reason why we get, went to Florida. And that's where I discovered becoming an actor. Um, my older brother was into the film industry. He went to full sale and that sort of jump started me to, you know, I want to do this. I want to try it out. So when I was in high school, I was always very dramatic and I was silly. I got, you know, class clown of the yearbook and they were like, you know, you should really try becoming an actor. You're, you're very dramatic and you're, you're good at like psyching people out. People take you Mm -hmm. too seriously. Um, I said, all right, I'll give it a shot. So I did theater program, um, joined uh, the the cast of Harvey, which was uh, a play that we did in high school. Uh, the drama teacher said, hey, I want you to be Elwood P. Down. It's a very challenging role. I said, bring it on. Let's do it. And from there on, I think it really uh, sparked me that this is what I wanted to do. And I got an agent while I was in high school. And my agent was sending me out auditions and I was booking things, but my school on the other hand was like, are you going to work? Like, are you missing school to go to work? And I said, kind of sort of, yeah, but Mm -hmm. what I'm doing now is really going to benefit my career later on down the road. I really need to do this. And school compromised with me. They said, all right, we'll let you go do this, but you have to keep good grades to do this and if you don't have you know if you get a a c or an f in a class then we can't let you go out and do auditions you have to let your agent know that i said done done deal so uh the master's academy in oviedo florida i thank them a lot for working with me to to go out there and pursue this career while i was in high school and because of that that's how i was able to get in the screen actors guild and so i owe them and my parents you know a big a big thank you for letting me do this. Wow. That's yeah. amazing. That's, I mean, what a great story. And, <laughs> you know, one of the things, and then I'm going to ask you the question of, you know, what's kept you in the business will be my next question. But before I get to that, I just want to say, I remember when I worked with you on Animal Kingdom, how impressed I was that you were not one of the people on set that were there just trading time for a paycheck. You were always on the phone. I could always tell you were doing something else. And I spoke your language because I think at the time I was editing a feature film that I, that we had just put into post-production and yeah. I saw you constantly doing things. And that was outside of, you know, some people just are there for the job, you know, and that's great. And I love that, but I could always tell you had other things going. So I guess that can lead me into the next question is what's kept you in the business for as long as you've been here? Well, when I first moved out here, um, in 2002, um, I, you know, looked up places to register like central casting and I just start diving into like background work. Mm-hmm. And just getting more experience on on bigger Hollywood sets. And one thing kind of led to the next. That's how I learned to become a stand-in. And uh, after that, I started getting a lot more stand-in work. And what 
I guess what kept me in is this. I wanted to just constantly be on set. I didn't want to take any other jobs. That, that's obviously changed because the times have changed a lot. I do a lot of uh, catering now, which is also fun, but it's also very flexible. Yeah. So if I have like a gig that comes up, I can cancel my shift and just keep on uh, being on set. So yeah, I just, I just love working on different shows and meeting new people and networking and helping people out. And then they help me out in return. Yeah. Well, and you said some things that, that I always love to highlight uh, when I'm interviewing actors or anybody in the industry is having a job outside of acting until you get to be in that 1% of actors that sustain their living solely on their acting. You know, for you, it's like you do the stand and you do the catering. Those are both very, fle- you know, the stand and gigs can be, you know, less flexible, but the catering gigs can be very flexible. I've done that myself many times. And to have a job that allows you flexibility to support your craft. And thank you for being so transparent about that because it is so important to not just depend on the acting gigs to always pay the bills because it's hit and miss. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. And, you know, when there's like hiatus time, that's when, you know, a lot of catering stuff can be happening and it just keeps me busy and, you know, it's a, it's good fun. Like I, I, I honestly don't mind it. It's uh, it's, I find doing catering a, an interesting way of playing with your acting skills and a way to improv with people and interact <laughs> with people. And I've done this and my people that I, I work with in catering can attest to this. So like, you look like you're messing with a lot of people. And I'm like, yeah, absolutely. I've talked to people in a British accent and I'll, I'm like, watch this table here. I'm going to talk to them in a British accent the entire night and see if they think of that I'm really from London. I and, then love the it. The, <laughs> and then at the end of the night, you're like, so what, you know, are you really, is that really, are you really from England? And I'll go, no, not really. I was just playing with you guys the whole night. Another working actor. Like, <laughs> yeah, that's right. <laughs> and I, it, I don't know, it's just, it's a fun way to play with your improv skills and, you know, you're, you're getting paid for it. Sure. Yeah. And, yeah. and um, you know, getting paid to work your work your craft. Right. And that's how I look at my stand in gigs is um, <clears throat> I'm getting paid to do my other work. Like there's a lot of work to be done and the days are long, but there's so much downtime that you get to do other things. And just like catering, you get to be different people and, and you know, not to mention just be of service. You know, that's just a nice thing to do in general. Um, yeah. But uh, yeah, no, you make the best of it. Right. Because it, we've all got to support ourselves and we can make it fun or we can make it miserable it can be i have to go to work or i get to go to work you know we have options exactly yeah so i noticed on your imdb and of course in following you in social media over the years um that you have produced and been an executive producer and you continue to do that when did you get into the that side of the business the producing side of the business um that kind of hit me back in I want to say like 2004 or five. Okay. Um, you know, when I first moved out here, it's like, I just want, I want to be an actor. And then all of a sudden it just dawned on me. Well, what if, you know, I can't act all the time. I want to stay in the industry. Let's try, you know, being a production assistant. Let's try being a casting associate or a ca- like a reader at a casting. Um, and then, Hey, well, why don't I try producing too? So the first film I produced was called Timmy the bag boy with my friend, Randy Kent, who we are still very close this day. He's, he's a brother to me. Try to work with each other as much as we possibly can. And he was the, the one that gave me the opportunity to produce, help produce his, his short film and also help cast it for him. And then when I did that experience, I was like, okay, I, I like this. Mm. This keeps me busy and there's lots of things to do when it comes to producing. Mm-hmm. And, uh, and I just found my, my spark right there that Timmy, the bag boy was my spark to just start getting into that. And that also opens up more doors too. It's like, you know, if I'm going to help you produce this, I, you know, can I have a, yep. 
all this. And that's how, that's one of my secrets, how I get all of these roles is doing it that way. Yeah. And it's, it's a fabulous secret to have when I had the um, production company that I was in for several years, that was it. You know, it was, I knew that in each role that I, or each project that I was producing, I was guaranteed a role in it. So it's, it's creating your own content, you know, and I think it's so smart to um, take the bull by the horns as opposed to waiting in line for all these auditions for these projects. Not only are you guaranteed a role in it, but you're also offering other people opportunity, which feels so good to be on the other side of it. Yeah. Yeah. And then, you know, once you work with them and they remember you, then it's like, hey, I got another project that I'm doing. You want to yep. do this with me? And, you know, I, I you build the relationships and that's been working since ever since I moved out here. <laughs> Yeah. And what what percentage, if you had to guess, or you might know if you keep your statistics, but as far as um, what is your ratio to bookings by relationship versus self-tape? Um, 95%. Relationship, right? Yeah. 95% yep. relationship. Yeah. Yeah. I'm the same way. I had that huge epiphany this last year when I did my statistics and I was like, I had 100% of my bookings were relationship. And I actually last year did not book one off of a self tape. And I was like, well, that's interesting. Yeah. Yeah. Yep. It's a relationship yeah. game. It sure is. Yep. They remember who you are and remember your work ethic on set and know that you're a good actor, or actress, and you give it your all, you know? Yeah. When you were working yeah. um, back in the day as a casting associate, what were some of the big takeaways you took from being on that side of the camera? Well, I definitely learned the what to do and what not to do because uh -huh. you'd see a lot of people come in and once you start reading with them, um, when you get the feedback from each person that came in, my you know my friend Randy would be like, "That was a bad read." Mm. So why is that a bad read? Well, the person was reading their lines, or they just they weren't in the moment or if I gave them direction, they did it exactly the, the, the same way they did it the yeah. first time. That's stuck not in good. their choices. Yeah. So that little notes like that, I was like, okay, I got it. And I I've seen like a lot of people do really amazing auditions and I've seen a lot of people do really bad auditions. Yeah. And uh, I learned the takeaways of what to do and what not to do when you're in the audition room and even in the waiting room that it's yes. like there's eyes on you even when you're in the waiting room as yeah. well yeah yeah it's so true you never know and same with on set right you have no idea who is sitting next to you like as far as even in background you have no idea who's producing something soon you know and like everybody on the set is there for a reason, you know, and it's like, be kind. You don't just be kind to the director and the actors. It's like, you are kind to the grips. You're kind to the cameraman. You're kind to the crafty, like, right. It's just like, yeah. you just never know. Yep. That's right. <laughs> and so when you are on the um, producer side of it, have you found that when you're going, let's say to get funding for a project, is it better in your experience to attach a name and then look for funding or have the funding in place so that you can attach an actor? I've always played with that, you know, which one comes first? Well, what was my experience with the, let's say the Mahal brothers, they always, um, they start off their initial fundraising on Indiegogo and halfway through that's when they're able to attach a name and i think what they do is they wait for some money to be in place to get a name and then once they say hey we have tara reed attached we have kevin sorbo we have tom sizemore attached that's when people are like all right well i'm in i want to i want to invest i want to be a part of this yeah and that's when the momentum starts um to grow and then you know somebody said why how come these guys have so much success raising money for their films? I'm like, because they, they have a track record. Their films look like they were, you know, they're, they're low budget films, but they look like they were shot for millions of dollars. Mm -hmm. um, and people want, you know, footage and real footage for, with acting opposite of these well-known celebrities. And that's why they, they dive in. Yeah. For sure. Yeah. Cause it's all about the name, you know, and that's what the, that's what the rest of the cast wants to see. And that's what the, you know, uh, distribution wants to see. Cause it's all about dollars and cents. Yep. 
and then you just you know when they hire these these guys they figure out a way to you know work them as much as they can for how much they have them for yeah. and then um then you know that they're wrapped sometimes they'll work like i remember art of the dead with tara reed they had her only for one day and yeah. there were so many scenes that they had to do with her i think they worked about almost 22 hours on set Jeez, Louise. with her and she was a go-getter like she was like Let, come on I'm, I'm down let's get this done let's do it and she yeah. pulled through she that was a entire time yeah yeah because it is when you when you get the you know obviously the higher the price tag per day you want to get as much done as possible and that's why it's so nice for people listening that are like writing their own content to keep in mind these key little parts that are pivotal to the story but they don't show up in every scene so that you can get somebody with a bigger name that's going to cost you more money but you're only going to need them for a day maybe two max because you can shoot them out um yeah. but just having them attached and having their face on your poster adds so much value mm -hmm. yeah. now you had the opportunity you mentioned the name tom sizemore you had the opportunity to work with him before he passed didn't you yes i did i i did a film with him um in 2020 when uh, things were slowly starting to open up again. Yeah. Um, it was right after Thanksgiving and it was a movie called the electric man with my friend, Brian Barsoglia, who uh, I worked with back in 2007. So again, going back to relationships. Yeah. He, every project he does is like, I have something for you in mind for my next one. So the electric man, he wanted me to play, um, a, a priest in a church. And the movie is kind of, uh, it's a very bizarre, fun type of movie where this this character played by Jed Rowan is constantly jumping timelines. And one of the moments that he's jumped, he's inside this church and Tom Sizemore is a carpenter in this church. But the the metaphor that they were kind of going for is that he's he's really Jesus Christ visiting mm. Jed and um, they have a, a, a heart to heart conversation. And then I come in. And I end up kicking Sizemore out of the church, having no idea who he is. And that's why his line is, I'm just a carpenter. Oh, and that's like a little reference to yeah. Jesus. So, And then Tom leaves. But um, working with him, like seeing how he worked, he he came in to set and he, um, he said, I'm just need some time to look over this dialogue. So... He spent, I want to say, almost three hours mm -hmm. reading his dialogue. And, we, you know, Brian was able to shoot little things around while we were waiting for Tom to be fully ready to go. Mm -hmm. And when Tom came in, he started knocking these scenes out of the park. And wow. uh, he worked very fast. And he was just he was just a joy to work with. And he was very professional. And I got to tell you, that man loves Coca-Cola. <laughs> He he had his assistant carry around little the little cans of Coca Cola, and when he was thirsty, he would hey uh, he would motion to his his assistant hey I need up. So when the Mahals hired him for uh, night of the Tommy Knockers, I told the Mahals make sure you have a good stash of Coca Cola put away for him because he constantly drinks that. He likes that stuff, so <laughs> that's amazing. That's see another thing. Good, good thing to know. You know, you want to make sure your actors have what they need, and uh, so that they can work their best. You know, everybody's got their own little things. <laughs> yep. And you noticed, you picked up on it, and you made sure that happened. That's awesome. Yeah. So as far as um, I tend to have a lot of newer actors, um, whether that be they're younger and just starting out, middle age, just getting a new career, sometimes retired and starting, a, you know, a new business. What advice would you have for somebody just starting out in the business? Well, here's here's my best advice I can offer them. Um don't shoot for one star, shoot for many stars. Mm -hmm. Your one star is, I want to be an actor. The many stars is like what I did. Hey, mm -hmm. I want to try that. I want to try a casting associate. I want to try a PA. I want to try this. You're going to find your, something is going to click with you to stay in this business. So I encourage, you know, I encourage all actors and actresses that are starting out, go audition for short films, student films. That's a great way to practice before you start getting in front of the big leagues. Mm -hmm. um, try to find a private acting coach. That's, that's reasonable. That can, you know, sit down with you for 
a few hours and you can pick their brain and then go through like mock audition processes so that you're prepared. So when you go into the audition room and somebody says, uh, could you go stand your mark, please? You're not, you're not saying, uh, what's, what's the mark? You know, you know what the yeah. mark is and, um, you know, you know what a slate is. Cause I've seen auditions where it's like, all right, go ahead and slate for me, please. And like, um, sorry, what's slate? Yeah. It's like, oh, that's not good. Um, so yeah, I encourage them to even just do practice auditions at home. Like, yeah go look on YouTube and look at people that are, that have mock auditions up and you can go to mock signs.com and get tons of signs from previous things that have been out there. And, um, don't burn your bridges. Mm -hmm. If you feel like you're not meant for a project or you don't feel like you, the project is right for you or it doesn't resonate with you. Don't, don't pass on it in a bad way. Mm -hmm. Like just say, just be respectful and, and move on and um the other thing too is promote the hell out of your work yes. no matter how small your your role is it, just because what that does is that makes the the people that hired you very happy and it, some actors you know they have like contracts where they have points invested in the film and that's you know when the film sees returns that's how they're going to get paid and it's just like well if you're not going to promote the film then you know how are you going to get yeah you know, your revenue yeah so it kind of boggles my mind sometimes when it happens so i no matter how big or small my role is i always promote the heck out of it and it also just keeps you busy on social media it keeps the appearance that you, you've always had something going on and sure. it's because when we first started out in 2002 the industry was way, way different. There was no, none of that at yeah. all. And then things just progressed and grew. And now everything is like your social media presence makes a huge difference in your career. And sometimes casting is based off of how many followers does this person have? What kind of content do they have on their, their TikToks or their Facebook? So yeah, a lot, of, a lot has changed. So if you don't have social media and you want to be an actor and actress, you definitely should get on it. And that's how you can start networking. That's how I've been able to find a lot of the films that I'm, I'm a part of is just by scrolling. Yeah. You know? Yeah. That's great. I know there's the uh, question I heard one time, do you want to be a secret or do you want to be a success? Cause you can't be both. Yeah. And it's like, you know, it sometimes it feels um, if you're not used to doing self-promotion, there can be this ick factor of, of putting yourself out there and once you get past the fact that you are promoting your business, there's nothing icky about it. It you, you know, we are our own business. And the only way to promote our business is to get it out there and to let people know that we're still in it. Because so many people start acting at a certain point and then decide, ah, it's not for me after three years and they go away. So if they don't know you're still there, they don't know you're still there. So I love that, you know, and I always enjoy seeing how much you're working on. And, you know, and like I said, you've got the IMDb credits to prove it. You've not stopped working for 20, over 20 years. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, that's amazing. It's, it's really great. So that's great advice for the um, actor that's, you know, just starting out. What about the person that's, say, been in the game for 10 years and they're not as far along as they wanted to be? What advice would you give to the person that might be going, is this for me? Um, I would I would say just keep on going because uh, yeah. I've been in that situation before. Even 10 years ago, too, I seriously had moments where I'm like, is this for me? Let me try something different. Let me try something new. Um and I would just say, just keep sticking with it because something is eventually going to stick. And I look back 10 years ago and I never thought I would be where I am right now. Uh, you just got to keep going. Yeah. You, you have to keep uh, looking at the light at the end of the tunnel. And yes, there are going to be roadblocks that are going to prevent you from getting to the light right away. But um, in the end, when you feel like it's, it's accomplished. I'm, I'm here where I want to be now. Yeah. It's a really, really great feeling.
Yeah, for sure. For sure. Yeah, no, that's great advice. And I uh, had done a recording uh, because yesterday was the beginning of the spring equinox and tomorrow is the new moon. And I'm all about timing and manifestation and all those kind of things. Can you speak to how any uh, manifestation processes you may have done or are doing that have helped you get your mind in the place of receiving the abundance that you have? Yeah. Um, going back to, to 2020, I'm going to be very, very open and, and vulnerable here, so to speak. Yeah. Um, when we were doing animal kingdom season five, uh, you know, we started in late January and mm-hmm. I was like, ah, this is great. I'm, I'm back with my family again. I love being here. This is freaking awesome. I just, I loved being on that show and, and just working with everybody and, I, I was so happy to be there every day. And then that week came in March, 2020. And Ugh. I felt the, the energy be very weird that week. I I'll never forget. We were at the, this big building, um, somewhere I'm trying to figure out we were like South of LA mm-hmm. and it was a skate park. It was an indoor skate park and we were there for several days and for some reason, it just, something didn't feel right at all. Mm-hmm. And the feeling kept escalating. It kept building. And then March 13th, I mean, that was the day where everything just kind of went down. And mm-hmm. um, I'll never forget John Wells coming in and saying, hey, so we're, uh, you know, you've heard the news. Things have shut down. We're going to take action shut down, too. We don't know how long it could be two weeks. It could be six weeks. Mm. Um, and every, like I could, like, I'm a very empathetic person. So I felt everybody's nervous and some somewhat angry energy. Yeah. Like, what the hell is going on? Um, then 2020 after that, uh, happened, you know, I fell into a very dark place, mm-hmm. uh, that year and it took a lot to, to pull me out um when we started back up production in september i was you know so happy to be back but i still there was still a dark void that was there and i you know it was what happened during that year was very traumatizing to a lot of people sure um and i was like i need to i need to figure out a way to pull myself out of this and i started you know, meditating and thinking about things that I wanted and to clear away, I started writing things down and all of a sudden, November, 2021, it took about a year to pull out of all of that. Things that I started writing down became a reality Mm -hmm. and it still is. And some of the stuff that I've written down has not come true just yet. yet. <laughs> and I've had other people say, oh, my manifestation hasn't come true yet. It's like, well, it, it's going to happen at the right time. Mm-hmm. Or it's just maybe it's not meant for you right now, but mm-hmm. it will happen. And a lot of things I've written down, like I have able to mark it off and it's it just keeps going. And ever since November 2021, a lot of things that I thought about, like in my career, like I wanted to be in a medieval movie. Yeah. <laughs> Then I got to to play a knight in a medieval movie that we shot in Texas. Yeah. Um, I wanted to be a lead role in a film in England. And then my friend Chris reached out to me. Hey, I have the lead role for you in a film that we're going to do in England in July. I was like, whoa, this is actually, uh, it's happening. Yes. It's happening. So I I tend to to keep doing that. And, you know, I want to help other people do that as well. Yeah, that's wonderful. No, and I love that so much. I'm I'm grinning ear to ear. And thank you for your transparency and in, in what you went through. And I'm so sorry that was such a difficult time. And as you acknowledged, it was such a bizarre time for the world, you know. And thank God you got through it. I got through it, you know. And the listeners were able to get through it. But you know, thank you for acknowledging that that was not an easy time. And um, as we record today, it's Monday, and I'm going to release the episode tomorrow, which is Tuesday, which is a new moon, which is a time that I always encourage people to write down 
around their intentions because it's a very powerful time. So thank you for sharing how that's mm -hmm. part of your manifestation process because it's powerful. It is very powerful and I believe in it and I've been doing it for 10 years and I can go back of 10 years of, of, of things that I've checked off my list and still some things have not come to pass, but they're not going anywhere. You know, they just roll over to the next year. <laughs> yep. Just keep it alive, you know, keep exactly. it alive. Yeah, so, so keeping a little vision board in your pocket, you know. Exactly, exactly. So as we're yeah. getting close to the 30-minute mark, are there any projects or anything that you were wanting to talk about um, that I didn't get an opportunity to ask you? Uh, let's see. Well, this year um, has been off to a really good start. Um, I just finished filming this past weekend uh, scenes for Another Planet from Outer Space Part 2 which was the sequel to Another Planet from Our Space, which we shot six years ago. And wow. my friend Lance was, uh, you know, just like, hey, dude, I want you to be in the sequel. Like, we've already shot most of the sequel, but I, I want your character to come back. Mm -hmm. And I figured out a way for him to come back. And I said, I'm on. Let me, let's do it. And uh, I'm slipping on that uniform on Saturday was very surreal because that the last time I wore that uniform was when we were um, promoting the movie. Wow. And uh, just putting it back on, I went right back into that character. I went right back into like being there where we were in 2017. And uh, it was so fun to be back. Um, and then I have a project possibly next month. Another thing I, manifested it my friend steven smith is doing a film in the uk and uh he asked me two weeks ago it's like hey are you are you free in april and do you want to be the lead in this and i said oh, absolutely yes i do <laughs> yes sirree <laughs> so uh, once everything is like locked and confirmed then i'll i'll be able to post more about that and then um then i have a film with sean whalen uh, at the end of April, his movie is called Crust. He's directing it. It's his directorial debut. Sean Whalen plays uh, one of the storm hunters in Twister. And I okay. love that movie. That movie was such a fun popcorn summer movie to watch. For sure. Yeah. I remember, I think I saw it like five or six times in the theater because it was just, it was so fun. And now to be able to, to work with him and, and act opposite of this guy that this goofy guy that I watched in Twister, I'm like, oh, this is so cool. So isn't that the best? Just being able to like, you know, eventually get elbow up to people who you've watched for years and you've enjoyed their work and admired their work. And the next thing you know, you're standing right next to them. It's like, wow, this is happening. Yep. You know, it's it's part of the it's part of the joy of being an actor is like watching that dream come true. Yes. You know, right in front and of acknowledging your eyes. it, like when it happens, like allow yourself to feel giddy and allow yourself to feel excited because otherwise, what are we doing this for? You know, yeah. it's like enjoy the moments as they come because they come and go. So when you've got one, grab it. Like take a mental note or even a picture so that you can look back and go, "Wow, that was cool." Exactly. Yeah. Yeah, there's. Uh... I love that. So, how can people connect with you on social media, or what platforms are you on, so people can enjoy following your journey as much as I do? Um, well, I'm on Facebook. I have a personal page, and then I have a, a fan page. And I, I sort of had to rebuild all of that a couple of years ago because Facebook. I guess a lot of accounts were hacked, and a lot of accounts yeah. got wiped out. Yeah. So I was one of those victims, and I had to rebuild from the ground up. Uh, but it's just Hans Hernke on Facebook and um, Instagram. And I have a YouTube channel as well. Okay. I put out a lot of interviews and Disneyland content and traveling videos, stuff like that. And I love shooting content for that. Um, so yeah, that's just my name Okay. on YouTube. And then uh, my IMDb is just my name. Great. And Fabulous. TikTok. I have a TikTok as well. It's just my name. And I put up all my little silly videos that I do up there once in a while. So yeah. I love that. And I love your love for Disney. Every time I see you at Disneyland, it brings my heart joy. <laughs> Aww. Yeah, it was, it was fun going yesterday. Um, I really needed that little time off. And, you know, I got a, the funny thing is I got a lot of weird looks from people wearing that Jurassic Park rain jacket. But that was the only jacket that I had in my car. And I didn't want to. I had a Disney shirt on yeah but um 
yeah, like even the cast members were poking at me like for wearing that jacket. And I was like, it's it's just a raincoat, guys. Right. <laughs> you know, I was carrying a Disney umbrella too. <laughs> but a lot of people like were giving me these weird looks and You're like, like wrong part, dude. <laughs> yeah. So that's what I on the cast says, like, hey, that's not our park. And I said, Well, you know, Disneyland... I don't work here. <laughs> Yeah, and Disneyland technically does have dinosaurs in it. I mean, there's For the, sure. one part of the track the, the train goes through this tunnel and you see dinosaurs there. So that's, that's my amazing. excuse. Yeah. I love or it. I, or I, I love say, it. Didn't you know that Disney's buying Universal? So this is okay. Exactly. We're all one yeah. family. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> oh well Hans thank you so much for taking the time to share your um, you know two decades plus of wisdom with my listeners I definitely got a lot out of it I hope the listeners did as well and, and again thank you for carving out the time you're welcome thank you for having me on I really appreciate it and I love talking to your audience and hey you know I'm down to do a follow up and I would definitely love to have you on my YouTube channel yeah for YouTube. sure I love that. I close every episode by saying, if no one else tells you today, I believe in you. Go create some miracles. Always believe that you can. Take it easy. Surrender to what is and enjoy blossoming into who you're becoming. Hans, we'll talk soon. Thank you, Amber. Have a magical day. You too. Bye-bye. Thank you. Bye.